This morning, as I've already mentioned, we're going to open up this uh, topic of um, the healing of the blind man. And uh, it is uh, an account that really uh, takes up the entire chapter, but we're not going to look at the whole chapter uh, for the sake of time. It would take, take too long, and there is so much in these first 12 verses. So let's begin by reading those first 12 verses of John 9. <clears throat> we read this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, How then were your eyes opened? He answered, The man who was called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, <clears throat> as you well know, and as you've already heard several times, uh, we have been looking in the evenings at how Jesus evangelized. Uh, first, we saw that example of how he dealt with Nicodemus telling Nicodemus that even though he was a member of the church and even though he was a teacher of the Jews, that he was still unconverted, that he needed a new birth. Again, reminding us that it's not enough to go to church or even to be a member of a church. You must be born again if you ever hope to see the kingdom in Christ and to enter it through faith in his name. The new birth is very integral to the message that we bring to others, particularly to those who are in the church, the ones that Stuart Alliott said are the unconverted Christians. Second, we saw the parable of the sower that reminded us that the seed of the gospel needs to be sown for people to be saved. And it must fall into good soil, that soil which has been prepared by God's Holy Spirit before it will bring about this new birth. But we also saw something very encouraging, and that is that the Lord can use us, that the Lord will use us, he'll use any of us who are willing to sow that seed. We don't have to be somebody special to do it, we just have to be willing in order, well, willing to, to bring the gospel that others might be saved. Now this morning, we're reminded of what it is that actually does save, who it is that actually saves through the gospel, and it's the one that the gospel is about, the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows us something of what Jesus does through his Holy Spirit in the faculties of our soul, in the faculty of the souls of the lost, in order to bring them to himself. Now, in verse 1, we, we read this, and we do see a transition now from what Jesus was doing before to what he is doing now. We read in verse 1, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. It's sometimes hard to tell where those, you know, the divisions are within the Gospels. Sometimes it looks like Jesus is doing everything in one place. But I think we have here an indication that this is now no longer the last great day of the Feast of Booze, but this is a different time. As Jesus continued his ministry, as he's continuing to teach and to preach throughout Palestine, he passed by a man who couldn't see. One, that John tells us, had been blind from birth all the way up to adulthood, somebody who had never seen in a day of his life. But we're also going to see here that Jesus didn't merely 
pass by him, but he actually opened this man's eyes, and not just his physical eyes, but also his spiritual eyes. We may not see that so clearly in the text that we just read, but it's certainly in this chapter. Now we do need to understand that what was true of him physically was true of each one of us spiritually. We also came into this world blind. We were born blind. There were certain things that we could not see, certain things that we had never seen, things that had to do with the beauty and the glory of the one who made the heavens and the earth because we were born without the ability to see those things. And we didn't see them until the Lord opened our eyes through the gospel. That's why we needed the gospel because that's how the Lord does it is through the gospel. And that's why those who are around us who are blind need the gospel as well because they are not going to be saved apart from it. The seed must be sown if eyes are to be opened. Now the story of the healing of the man without sight reminds us that Jesus is the one who does this. He is the only one who does this, the only one who can open the eyes of the spiritually blind. Those who are outside of Christ, outside the church, wandering around in darkness right now will continue to do so until somebody brings the Lord Jesus Christ to them, that they might see and be saved. Now the first thing we see in this text is the disciples' question, which is a very interesting question. When they saw this blind man, they wondered how he came to be in this condition. And so they asked Jesus in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, they knew that this blindness must be the result of sin, but the question is, whose sin? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Now, the Bible does tell us very plainly that the Lord does not overlook sin. As a matter of fact, he never does. And the Bible tells us that God actually deals with sin. Sometimes, uh, well, I should say all the time, he deals with it every single day. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to correct everything in this world that people do. Some of that is reserved for the day of judgment, of course. But God does deal with sin on a daily basis in this world before people actually leave this world. Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, who does that? Basically, everyone who is not a Christian does that. Now, thankfully, he often does this in order to lead people to repentance. He did that oftentimes with Israel. He brought difficulty, tragedy. He brought foreign armies. He brought famine. He brought disease in order to get them to turn away. And he does that also with the people of this world. But that isn't always the case. He also judges those who will not repent. Sometimes people are destroyed in God's judgment, sadly, because they won't turn from their sins. But God does deal with sin on a daily basis. And sometimes the Bible says that he actually does this because of the sins of the parents, which would explain the disciples' question. Was it the parents who sinned? Now, when God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai to give him the Ten Commandments, he said this very clearly in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. He says, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands. We don't ever want to forget the first part of this section and just focus on the second part. God is a God who is compassionate and gracious. And we know that because we have experienced it through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't want to forget the second part either. He says this, Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Does the Lord sometimes visit the children of 
those who are wicked with judgment? The Bible says that, as a matter of fact, he does. Now, we do need to understand what that means and what it doesn't mean. Does this mean that, that God punishes the children because of the parents' sin or for their parents' sin? Well, yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that he's not punishing them for what the parents did, but it means that he is punishing them for what they did. Basically, the connection to the parents means this, that sometimes God will withhold mercy that he might have otherwise shown these children because of the sins of their parents. Do we have any examples of that in Scripture? We have lots of examples. What happened to the firstborn in Egypt? They were all killed by the avenging angel, by the angel of death. And why? Because of Pharaoh, because of his sin, because of the, basically the father or the head of that entire nation. What happened to the children of, of Achan? What happened to the children of Dathan? What happened to the children of Korah? Well, basically, they were all destroyed because of the sins of their fathers. What, what happened to Canaan and those that were in the land of Palestine whom the Lord devoted to destruction all came about because of what Ham actually did? Yes, God does visit the iniquity of the parents upon the children, but we do need to remember that when God punishes these children, he is punishing them for their own sins, not the sins of their parents. The sins of the parents are the reasons why he passes over them in his mercy. Again, let's just back up for a minute. Don't we all deserve the judgment of God? If God punishes us, is he unjust for that? No. We get so used to mercy, we begin to expect that from God, and He is very, very merciful. But we all deserve that judgment except for the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord does often pass over people in His mercy. By the way, I should just mention, here's one very important reason why we who are parents should follow the Lord as closely as we are able to follow, because the way we live not only affects us, but it will affect our households in the long run for good or ill. Now, sometimes the Lord breaks that chain. Sometimes he's merciful even if the parents aren't faithful. Sometimes God will save those who come from a very ungodly line, and we need to be thankful that he does, that he is a merciful God. But we do need to realize that this is still true nonetheless. And so another reason why we should walk carefully with the Lord. And those of you who are young, who are yet to marry and have children, why you should follow the Lord now. And why you should love Him and serve Him and, and find someone that you can marry whom you can serve the Lord with and raise children with because what you do is going to affect them. Now, the question we need to ask is, is that why this man was born blind? Well, Jesus says, no, that wasn't the reason. Not in this case. But now what's more interesting is the first part of their question. Notice what they said. Could it have been this man's own sin that caused him to be born blind? Uh, that's kind of a strange question, isn't it? I mean, basically, did the man sin before he was actually born? Is there something he did maybe in the womb that could have brought this about? You know, I, as I delved into this, I was interested to find out that uh, a couple of commentators, John Gill and Matthew Henry, noted that there was a belief among the Jews, God's people, in the Old Testament and during the time of Jesus' ministry on earth and, and the disciples' question, a belief among the Jews of the transmigration of the soul. Basically, they believed in a form of reincarnation. And they also believed that it was possible for a child to sin before he was born, that he could commit some wicked act in the womb that would actually lead to some sort of a physical defect. Gill writes this in his commentary. He says, this notion, that is this notion of transmigration, Josephus says, A, was embraced by the Pharisees, though, according to him, it seems that they only understood it of the souls of good men, not the wicked. They were punished, but the good men could somehow come back. And if so, this could lay no foundation for such a question unless these disciples had given into the Pythagorean notion of a transmigration of all souls, which was, known, which was to be known by defects as 
blindness. You know, it almost sounds like the idea of karma, isn't it? Uh, you do something bad in a past life and then you get kind of demoted and you have to be punished in a future life until somehow you gain, you know, your good karma back and you progress until you finally make it to wherever you're headed. Well, no, they didn't believe that and the notion that the Jews believed in transmigration wouldn't fit either. So he says this, or else this question proceeded upon a principle received by the Jews that an infant might do that which was faulty and criminal and actually sin in the womb, of which Dr. Lightfoot has given instances. Dr. Lightfoot was, um, actually lived during the time of the Puritans and was a scholar in Jewish tradition, the Talmud and so forth. So they thought, well, maybe... Maybe he sinned if they bought into this Pythagorean idea. Maybe this blindness means that he had sinned in a past life. Or maybe he sinned in the womb. Now, of course, the fact that the Jews thought that these things could have been true doesn't make it right. You know, even the Jews, even though the Jews had the Old Testament scriptures, they still got a lot of things wrong. I mean, look at all the corrections Jesus had to make when he came into the world. And if it seems strange to you that a people could have the scriptures and still make such blunders as this, just read the writers, uh, Christian writers, after the apostles went off the scene who had the New Testament. Look at all the mistakes they made. Uh, just because you have the scriptures, it doesn't mean you're always going to get things right. Now, it's also possible that the disciples thought that the Lord looked ahead and saw that this man was going to commit some great sin in the future and was punishing him for that. Now the question we need to ask, I think we need to ask a couple of questions. First of all, was the blind man guilty before he came into the world? Well, actually he was, but so is everyone. It wouldn't explain his blindness, but it would explain a lot of things. David, you'll recall, writes in Psalm 51, 1, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Eliphaz, as he's arguing with Job in Job 15, 14, says this, What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? It, it can't happen. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When we are born into this world, we are born of the flesh and we are only flesh and we are guilty and sinful. Was this man's blindness the result of sin? Well, yes, it was, but that's true of all sickness and disease. It wasn't because of his personal sin, which is what the, the disciples were asking. And it wasn't because of the sins of his immediate parents it was ultimately the result of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And that's why we are just as guilty when we are born into this world. We are born dead in trespass and sin. We are just as blind as this man, blind to God's beauty and his glory, all because of what Adam and Eve did. Now that's the bad news. There's always bad news and you really can't understand the good news until you see the bad news. But this is the good news. The good news is that Jesus came into the world to undo what it is that Adam and Eve did. He came to undo or to reverse the effects of sin. The reason why God allowed sin to enter into the world in the first place was so that he might reveal his mercy and his grace to us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So getting back to the question, why did the Lord allow this particular man to experience this particular affliction? Well, it wasn't because of his personal sin and it wasn't because of the sin of his parents. It was because of the sins of Adam and Eve, but there was an even greater reason, the ultimate goal that God had in mind, and that was to glorify God. We read in verse 3, Jesus says to his disciples, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The reason why this man was born blind was that Jesus might heal him and that Jesus might reveal himself through his healing and that he might glorify his Father and that he might save many people. Now we might ask this question, how could God do that? 
How could he cause this man to be born blind simply in order to bring glory to himself? That, that's kind of an odd question, isn't it? Because I hope we understand by now everything God does. He does to bring glory to himself. That's the reason why he created what he created. Does not the potter have the right over the clay to do with it what he wills? God has absolute right in order to do that. But what if the thing that he determines to do actually ends up for, as it were, the well-being of that individual and the blessing of that individual? Now we also need to understand this that God did not directly afflict this man with blindness. He didn't reach down into the womb and blind the man. Uh, just as he also didn't directly cause sin to come into the world. He didn't force Adam and Eve to choose against his will. He allowed it to come through their free choice. When God created Adam and put him in the garden to guard that garden, he knew that Adam would fail. But he allowed him to fail so that sin might enter into the world, so that he might reveal to us the riches of his grace and his mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what do we see here? We see the Lord using the results of sin, which is blindness, to bring about something wonderful, not only to reveal that he is the Messiah, but to save this man. We know from what we've just read, the Lord was about to give him not only physical sight, but spiritual sight as well. The Lord allowed evil to enter into the world so that he might bring good out of it. He allowed sin to invade his world so that the Lord might conquer it. That is why Jesus Christ came into the world. He came to overcome the curse that sin brought into the world. And our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that is something that he would, he said to his disciples, something that he would continue to do as long as he was in the world to shine the light of his Father's word. He is the light of the world, the one who shines in the darkness. He says in verses 4 through 5, We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, Jesus here is describing to us what his ministry was all about. To reverse the effects of the fall. I mean, wasn't the work Jesus was doing to bring good out of evil? To reverse the effects of sin? Isn't that why he was healing the sick? Isn't that why he made the lame to walk? Isn't that why he delivered those who were demon-possessed and why he made the blind to see? And again, not just physically, but spiritually. Man fell away from God and brought a curse on himself, but the Son of God came to free men from that curse. Now we might say the fall <clears throat> actually brought with it a great deal of work. All the work that we have to do is the result of the fall. There is because of the fall, the potential for a great deal of ministry. I mean, Jesus realized that, which is why he continued to work and to minister as long as he was alive. But you see, there was only so much that Jesus could do during the time of his life. He characterizes his life and the lives of his disciples as a day. That is the time of their opportunity, the time in which they can work and do the works of the one who sent him. But night was coming. The physical death that would eventually overtake all of us when they would no longer be able to work. So while he was here, he was the light of the world. He was the source of the gospel, pointing men to God. And the same was true of his disciples. Now, isn't the same thing true of us? We are the ones who have the light. We are the ones who are to be the light of the world. This is our day. This is our opportunity as long as health and strength permit us to labor for the Lord. We need to be advancing God's kingdom while it is still day because soon night comes. It comes sooner than we expect it to 
And even if we live out our full lives, you know it's just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Soon, night is going to fall for each one of us and we are going to enter into our rest. And so we need to labor and do the works of the one who has sent us into the world while it is still day, realizing the night is coming when we will no longer be able to do it. Now in verses 6 and 7, we read this. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Jesus healed this man's eyes to show that he is the one who is able to heal the eyes of the soul. But why did Jesus do it in this way? Now, there's an interesting question. Why didn't he just speak the words? I mean, he did that on another occasion. S just touch the man's eyes and make him well. Well, we can only speculate here. Sometimes it's interesting to speculate, but we can't know for certain. Maybe he did this to remind the man where he came from. Remember, the Bible says God made man of the dust of the ground. And now... God in human flesh is repairing him with dust from the ground. You know, he's making new parts, putting them on, as it were. Or maybe it was to show who this one was that was actually healing him, the one who originally made man from the dust of the ground, and he was repairing the damage that sin had done to him because here was God now in human flesh reversing the effects of sin. John Gill actually suggests that the reason why Jesus did it this way was to give us a picture of, of the gospel. Just as it seems foolish to anoint this man's eyes with clay, that that would, have, would do anything towards healing him. So the Lord has chosen the foolishness of the gospel preached to save men from their sins. And again, that is certainly possible. But the important thing to see here is that Jesus healed him, that he did open his eyes even if he did it in an unusual way. This was something that was completely unheard of. This was something that had never happened before. There was no record of such a miracle in the Old Testament. This was something the Lord had reserved for Messiah as the evidence that this was he. Now we're going to see more about that in the following verses, but, uh, so we're not going to labor it here. But I wanted to bring it up because the fact that this was unusual, very unusual, this was unique, a unique occurrence, is also the reason why those who knew the man did not recognize him once his eyes were opened. We read in verses 8 and 9, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others are saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the one. You can see they were struggling with believing that this could possibly be the same man. I think the same thing happened with you know, the beggar who was also lame and was healed. Now, I already told you why they were having a difficult time accepting that because we never see blind men being healed. That was, that was unusual. But the same thing is true in a spiritual sense when the Lord actually opens the eyes of the blind, isn't it? Because when the Lord opens your eyes and he brings you to himself, in some sense, in many senses actually, it, it makes it hard for those who knew you before to recognize you because you're no longer the same person that, that you were. You no longer see things the way you used to see them. The things of the world that you thought were so important before that you just had to have, like the rest of your friends, were no longer important. And the things that you thought were foolish, that had no value, such as the things of the Lord, suddenly become the most important. And because of that change, you no longer behave the way you used to. You begin to go a new direction. So much so that the people who actually knew you before don't really know you anymore. They don't recognize you and many times they don't want to be around you anymore. But sometimes they will, at least for a while, if nothing else for curiosity's sake. I want you to notice that these people were curious. 
They wanted to know what happened. Sometimes people want to know what happened. We read in verse 10. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? Now when that happens, when those who knew you before see the difference that, that Jesus Christ is making in your life, you do need to be ready to tell them what it is that made the difference, which is what this man did. In verse 11, he answered, the man who was called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and wash and I received sight. Now, he didn't know very much about Jesus. He just says this, this man who was called Jesus, that's about all he knew about him, did this for me. I, I don't know much about him, but I do know this, I was blind, but now I see. That's really all it takes, isn't it, when you're sharing Christ with others, your testimony. Sometimes it's all it takes to, to inform a person what, they, you know, what you need to tell them in order for them to come to Christ, in order to sow the seed. We all have a testimony, and we can all use that as a means to reach out to others. I was blind, but the man who was called Jesus gave me sight. The gospel is really quite simple, isn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now finally we read in verse 12, they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. After Jesus healed the man, he left. He left the place. So when the man returned, Jesus wasn't there any longer. But I want you to notice that even though that was the case, his testimony had still done its work. The crowd wanted to see this man who had performed this miracle. And this is ultimately what we hope for when we witness to others. Jesus doesn't have to be here, but the fact that he changed our lives may provoke within the curiosity to know more about him. Now in our case, we know where he is. We know that he's gone to be with heaven. And we know what we need to tell others who want to see him, how they can see him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Look to heaven, look toward heaven, ask the Lord to open your eyes. He can give sight to the blind. Now, a question we need to ask ourselves in closing is, is this. Do you know anybody that's blind? Do you know anybody who's without Jesus Christ? Jesus tells us that he came into the world to be the light of the world. He came into the world to open the eyes of the blind. Now, Jesus has already finished his day. He's already in heaven. His day is over. The night has come for him. He is still working. He's still interceding. He's still sending his spirit. But he is working still through us as well. It is our day. It is our opportunity. The Lord Jesus Christ says to you and he says to me that he wants you to sow the seed of the gospel in the lives of those whom you know are blind in order that they might see. He wants you to share your testimony with them. Tell them what he did for you. He actually has performed a miracle, so to speak, hasn't he? He has raised you from death to life, and you are different now. And he wants you to tell others what he has done. This is how the Lord brings the lost to saving faith. This is the method he uses. This is how seed is sown. This is how... The hard soil of the heart is broken up. This is how the Lord gives the new birth. This is how he gives sight to the blind. By the way, giving sight to the blind is the same thing as the new birth. It's the same thing that he meant when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. This is how the Lord does it. He uses us to bring the seed of the gospel and our testimony to them that he might convert them that he might change them, that he might open their eyes, unstop their ears, break up the stony heart, and give them a heart of flesh. The Lord wants to use you and me, so let's seek as best as we possibly can out of love for what the Lord has done, us, done for us to be as useful as we possibly can be for his glory. On the other hand, let me ask you this morning, are you blind? Are you without Christ? Are you a Christian that needs to be converted? Or are you not even a Christian? Have you never even professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What does this text say to you this morning? It tells you, come to the Savior. 
Jesus is passing by right now, just like he did pass this blind man so many years ago. And he's willing to turn aside and heal you if you're willing to receive him. He is drawing near to you through the gospel. So what should you do? Reach out to him and take hold of him by faith. Be like blind Bartimaeus who, when he heard Jesus passing by, cried out for the Lord to come and heal him. And even though the crowd told him to be quiet, he wouldn't stop until Jesus came. Reach out and take hold of him by faith. Be willing to leave your old life behind and trust in the Lord to save you. And if you are willing to do that, he is willing to save you. Again, our Lord Jesus tells us very graciously that everyone who comes to him, he will not cast out. So if you're blind and without Christ, come to him this morning and receive your sight. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us supply what we've heard.